She's going to come back. Yeah, I talked to Sarah. Yeah. Um, I might as well. I might as well. Tomorrow when I'm there, just get the ball rolling. Just rolling on the side. She was fine going out with her numbers. We should get them out Yeah, I think so. Her number is like, I mean, you know, she's not. See the idea. She's heckled down. Yeah. yeah. So we're fine. I think it's fine. Mexico. 
forward to keep it. And then celebrate your efforts. No I don't know. I I Before Joyce gets started, I've been sending out emails. Uh, I just want to remind you the last session of the year is a dinner up at the faculty club. And a week from today, I have to go up there and make the arrangements for how much food and so forth. So I need a reasonably accurate 
headcount, it's free, so there's no real downside in coming. <laughs> <laughs> and um, a couple of our colleagues will bring the wine for the evening, so we'll have some good drink as well. Um, Joyce, for those who don't know her, is are you still chief of medicine over at Virginia Mason? Um, hospital medical. Hospital Medical Director, and one of our colleagues for a, a long time. When I look at this topic, it's a little like when Dave Naimi did f pies, which I had never heard of, as a, uh, I'm embarrassed to say. Uh, like I'd say, was this something new that they just invented? <laughs> this is the way I feel about auto-inflammatory diseases. About five years ago at the Quiet AI meeting, all of a sudden there was a session on inflammasomes, and I wondered what were inflammasomes. This has come together as a cohesive and very interesting group of diseases that we probably were missing for a long time. Uh, so this is a, a really interesting, I think, addition to our specialty as we outgrow asthma and rhinitis and need new, uh, new directions and new adventures. So thank you. So every year when I get one of these topics, uh, um, Lynn never fails to uh, disappoint me because it has to be something that I have no idea what it's about and then I have to Google it to find out. <laughs> and this year, once again, that was what happened. Um, I spend most of my time worrying about are there enough hospital beds or some hairy bioethical problem in the hospital. So uh, this was really fun to dive into, but I knew nothing about it. Uh, oh, and I, and I have no disclosures, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so the first thing I did was Google it, and uh, I think definitions are always helpful. Uh, the National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Skin Diseases says, quote, a relatively new category of diseases that are different from autoimmune diseases. However, autoimmune and autoinflammatory diseases share common characteristics in, uh, in that both groups of disorders result from the immune system attacking the body's own tissues and also result in increased inflammation. And uh, a Jackie review from 2009, which actually is still a really good review if you just want to get a primer on this, uh, says, quote, a group of illnesses characterized by episodic or sometimes chronic inflammation without evidence of high titer autoantibodies or antigen-specific T cells. So that's what autoinflammatory diseases are. Um, and so if you compare autoinflammatory diseases with autoimmune diseases, autoinflammatory diseases you are dysregulation really of that innate immune system. And as you know, the innate immune system is really uh, that kind of the oldest uh, immune response. It's evolutionarily, you find it in plants, uh, you find it in Dros Drosophila. Um, and it recognizes, uh, as you know, recogni recognition of exogenous and endogenous danger. It's uh, mediated through those pattern recognition things, uh, uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns, and uh, danger-associated molecular patterns. Uh, there's no fine-tuning with gene uh, rearrangement or somatic mutation. And contrast to the adaptive immunity, which is recognition of foreign antigen mediated through receptors on T and B cells, uh, you do undergo somatic mutation, rearrangement, specific selection, and you have this diverse repertoire that enables the development of memory. But the truth of the matter is these things interact because the innate immunity actually activates uh, the adaptive immunity. So they're really very much evolved, um, and I think as we go forward, there are more complex autoinflammatory diseases that actually impact both parts of the immune, both arms of the immune system. So, uh, hopefully, uh, you probably can't read that, but hopefully, it's on your handout. This is from that uh, review in 2009, and uh, these monogenetic autoinflammatory syndromes, uh, all of them, in fact, are, uh, result in increased IL 1 beta. And, uh, you know, we were just lucky that. These really, these are on the far end of the spectrum. Uh, uh, they identified a gene and an abnormal protein and an inheritance pattern. And this is how these things got described. And in 1999, Kastner's colleagues, when they were looking at a Mediterranean, um, uh, familial Mediterranean fever, they developed this construct of anti-inflammatory uh, disease to try to explain what was happening in this disease process. And very shortly thereafter, uh, the gene uh, and the protein, which is pyrin, were uh, recognized. It turned out to be autosomal recessive. 80% of the cases occurred before the age of 20. Uh, with these periodic flares, every one to uh, three days, you would get fevers and myalgias and arthralgias. 
And uh, if you look at the organs that were impacted, the skin, joints, per uh, uh, peritoneum, and pleura, so those sorts of things. And shortly thereafter, um, uh, I think the entire genome was, uh, uh, they released the entire genome um, uh, sequencing in 2004. So this was a little before that, but the techniques were there, and they, people were really starting to crank out the gene stuff. Uh, so they described all of these other um, syndromes. Uh, HAPS, which is the uh, myopurion uh, associated um, inflammatory disease, it has those three uh, different ones, familial cold, muckle wells, and uh, uh, neonatal onset multi-system inflammatory disease, which we're going to talk about because they're really the model for how people look at this. But they've been subsequently described lots of other ones, hyperimmune uh, immunoglobulin D syndrome, um, let's see, PAPA, which is, I've got to get this one right, pyogenic arthritis, pyodermin gangrenosum, and acne syndrome. Um, and down at the very bottom there, uh, DIRA, which is the deficiency of the Ig uh, IL-1 receptor antagonist. So lots of different diseases, most of them autosomal dominant. Most of them happen early in childhood, although there are a couple of them that have the onset more in the uh, late teens, early 20s. Um, and they all impact kind of the same organ systems, the skin, uh, the meninges, um, uh, inner ear, and some of them where people lose hearing. Uh, but a whole, uh, all just really basically described within the last um, six, uh, six years or so ago, but like in the last 10 years, a whole new group of diseases. So I had to go back and think about innate immunity and how it gets initiated. And um, so a little review more for me probably than you, but uh, PRRs are these pathogen recognition receptors they're located in the cell membrane, but also in the cytosol. And they're really these things that are just sensing the environment. Uh, they recognize those highly uh, conserved motifs. The PAMPs are pathogen-associated molecular um, patterns, and the DAMPs are damage-associated molecular patterns. Some of them are transmembrane, so they're looking to the outside, and those are the toll-like receptors and the C-type um, lectin receptors. And then there are the ones that are in the cytoplasm. Uh, there's the Rig receptors, and the nucleotide binding, called, I can't even say this, oligomerization domain, which are those nod-like receptors. And so when I tried to put that together in my own mind, this is sort of what I came up with. So, on the, on the, so over here, uh, you have the ones that are on the surface, uh, toll-like receptors and the retinoic acid-inducible gene ones. And then over here on the cytosol, you have those nucleotide binding and oligomerization oligomerization domain, which are the nod-like receptors. And they aren't separate, they're not like, you actually require both, and the two together really complement and synergize together. And when these things get targeted, uh, you start uh, activating these things called inflammasomes. And in the particular case that we're gonna be talking about, uh, when these uh, inflammasomes get uh, activated, they uh, re uh, develop IL-1 beta and its uh, cousin IL-18. And that's really pretty much uh, the whole thing about this talk. But there are other, uh, lots of other inflammasomes that are starting to be uh, described. This is just the one that's probably the best to describe and, and, uh, currently. So um, the IL-1 cytokine family, uh, I was going back to look at this, and there are 11 members in this family. And uh, they all have really significant structural homology um, between the members, but their biological functions vary widely. Some of them are anti-inflammatory, and some of them are inflammatory. IL-18 actually uh, has a role in T-cell uh, uh, helper-1 differentiation. Um, IL-33 uh, induces uh, TH2 polarization. Uh, IL-36 here actually has four isoforms, and it um, is considered a pro-inflammatory cytokine that's important in um, psoriasis. Um, and then IL-38, which I love, it's uh, IL-1 family member 10, also known as IL-38. It's sort of like Prince. Um, <laughs> uh, it's supposed to have anti-inflammatory activity. But the ones that are most studied are these guys up here. Um, and uh, IL-1A is probably the least studied of those three. And it um, has the same sort of activity as IL-1 beta, but it's actually inside of cells, and it's not actively released, and it binds to plasma proteins in the cell. Uh, it gets released when cells die, and so you actually see big high levels of it when people have strokes, when they have heart attacks, 
Uh, you see it, the acute renal failure is almost like a biomarker for those diseases. Um, and it'll ooze into cells, um, and it's one of the things that can actually trigger the formation of uh, inflammasomes. Uh, so they call it an alarmant, is what they call it. Um, IL-1 receptor antagonists, um, as in all of these biologic systems, if you have the one active inflammatory thing, you need to have the thing that turns it off. And that's what this really acts as. And it's actually found, I think, yeah, virtually all tissues. And, um, and it binds to IL-1 receptor, but it doesn't turn the cell on. So it kind of counteracts IL-1 beta. Now, IL-1 beta is really actually a pretty cool protein. Um, and as I was telling Lynn beforehand, I think I'm going to invest in this, the anti-IL-1 betas, because basically it's important in all kinds of inflammation in almost all um, organ systems. Uh, in host defense in animal models, interestingly, it's really important in protection for candida uh, in intracellular organisms like Salmonella, Listeria, and Mycobacterium. We've had um, anti-IL-1 beta uh, drugs since about 2003, really good ones, and interestingly, when patients are on these drugs, unlike tumor necrosis factor, um, anti-TNF-alpha, these patients don't get these diseases. Uh, they, they've looked and they just, so we're really not sure why, but if you're an animal, you really want your IL-1 beta if you're a mouse. Um, it systemically uh, induces fever, uh, hepatic phase uh, uh, response, C-reactive protein and serum amyloid A, and it acts on the bone marrow to promote neutrophilia. Uh, and uh, those of you who uh, can kind of think back, like maybe eight or years or so ago, it was used um, as a, they did a, uh, several big studies using it for, uh, to see whether it would make a difference in sepsis. Um, and it turned out that it didn't really um, uh, uh, increase mortality or decrease mortality, so they don't use it anymore. It's interesting, as I was reading this, because uh, sepsis is really this, uh, probably like asthma, this diffuse variety of diseases because you can't, there's no biomarkers, and it's just based on kind of, you know, fever and, and uh, lactic acid. So the, my, my thought was that maybe there are some sub, subgroups of sepsis that would actually respond to a drug like this. We know that uh, there are families who get sepsis, sepsis where the mother had sepsis, uh, the kid goes in the hospital and gets a disease and gets sepsis. So thinking about what about those genetic things, and could it really be a useful drug? On the local level, it induces expression of cell adhesion molecules like ICAM, VCAM, T-selectin, and E-selectin. Uh, it promotes neutrophil recruitment to inflammatory tissues, and it acts directly on neutrophils and other leukocyte populations to regulate their activity and production of other inflammatory mediators. And so um, this is uh, kind of all of these different cell types produce IL-1, and actually IL-1 stimulates most of these cell types. So neutrophils, monocytes, uh, Th17 cells, uh, ILC3 uh, cells, and osteoclasts all crank out IL-1. And IL-1 has uh, an amazing variety of different um, activities. Uh, and the cartilage is kind of really actually amazing. You see my note here. Um, it increases the expression of the most potent enzymes involved in cartilage de degradation, including collagenase 3, uh, stromolysin 1, and type 1 and type 2 gelatinases, and it decreases the synthesis of cartilage matrix proteins. So um, it really, and interestingly, you can, uh, although it's really high levels in the synovial fluid of people with rheumatoid arthritis, there's also high levels of it in people who have osteoarthritis. If you know that in people that get osteoarthritis, there's kind of people that have mild arthritis, and there are people that really get debilitating arthritis, and they're probably different diseases. And as we're going to talk later, um, these anti-IL-1s may be really actually helpful in osteoarthritis, and you can imagine how much that broadens the use of those um, biologics. It's very important. Um, it can cause osteoclast activation and bone loss. In, uh, your, uh, blood, uh, in the blood vessels, it causes intimal inflammation and arthrogenesis. Uh, in the hypothalamus, the fever response and pain processing, uh, hence sepsis. And in the pancreas, it actually causes B cell apoptosis and uh, it's been connected to diabetes. And if you think about people with rheumatoid arthritis, they have a markedly increased uh, incidence of uh, both coronary artery disease and diabetes. So this all starts kind of making some sense. So what are uh, inflammasomes? They're kind of these things inside the cells that are the sensors of danger and the initiation of, of autoinflammation. 
Uh, the nod-like receptors um, are the intracellular sensors, and the one that we're going to talk a lot about today is NLRP3, which is probably the best characterized, but there's a variety of different ones uh, that actually form different types of inflammasomes. Uh, they're, they're kind of like a molecular um, structure uh, that, uh, and the NALP3 uh, results in increased caspase 1 mediated IL1 one beta processing and secretion. Uh, and it's triggered by lots of different uh, stimuli or what your cell would consider as danger signals. So microbial components, but also large inorganic crystalline structures, asbestos, silicon, uh, uric acid crystals, because this is being used in gout. Um, yeah, and signs of distress in, uh, cell, cells, uric acid, ATP, uh, DNA and RNA fragments. So the ones that we're going to kind of concentrate on today are the, um, the cryopyrin associated periodic syndromes because they're the best characterized. Uh, these really have been, uh, they're about 15 years old. Um, all, there are three different disorders in this group, the familial cold, uh, urticaria syndrome, uh, Muckle-Wells syndrome, and neonatal onset multi-system inflammatory disorder. And why these are important to allergists is most of them do get these urticaria-like eruptions. When you look at them, you'll think uh, it looks like garden variety hives. They can occur on a daily basis. Uh, they can have diurnal variations. Sometimes they uh, happen periodically. Uh, they're most often distributed symmetrically on the trunk and extremities, just like regular hives. Uh, but most importantly, the lesions aren't itchy, and uh, they don't respond to antihistamines. And I was kind of going through my Rolodex of my patients all over the years that had stuff like this that I wasn't very helpful for, and I'm wondering how many people I missed. Um, the other features, though, these people get recurrent uh, fever episodes, they get malaise, and, and joint ocular and neurologic um, manifestations. And remember, these are at the far end of the spectrum because they have a gene that clearly is, uh, doesn't work. Um, uh, I apologize, so you may not be able to see that. Hopefully, you've got a hand out there. Um, it turns out that, there, uh, as I said, you know, the, the ones that are transmembrane uh, and then the ones that are in the cytosol, it turns out that you really have to have both of these signals. And these two things really do synergize with each other in order to form an inflammasome. So the first signal there is uh, a micro, um, microbe or something like that that binds to this toll-like receptor and turns on mighty, uh, mighty 88. And uh, here in the, in the nucleus, you get the... And have kappa beta that starts this transcription and translation. And you get these pro IL1 and pro IL18 that are sitting in the cell. So this you know, microbial trigger gets this started, but it's not enough. And so the second signal, and this is actually a paper from January of this year, and these are kind of suggesting not all of these have been completely proved, but they think particulates can be that second signal. So things like amyloid, cholesterol, silica, uric acid crystals right here, they get um, into a, a, a lysosome, you get lysosomal damage, and you get these mm -hmm. things released, the ATP that can get this going, um, and cassettsin B, which activates the uh, formation of an inflammasome. You can have other, you know, bacteria, viruses, stuff like that, that go through these receptors, and um, a lot of those are uh, caused by potassium influx, and that will activate the inflammasome. Um, this receptor here, which of course you guys are not going to be able to see, is P2X7, uh, and that's where the ATP will come in, and again, start the inflammasome. And then over here, DAMPs and PAMPs, a lot of, the, a lot of times they work through um, mitochondria, they make a reactive oxygen species, and those cause the formation of these inflammasomes. And the inflammasome has this um, uh, NRL, uh, NLRP3, uh, which is that nod-like receptor, it has this accessory protein attached to it that has uh, uh, affinity for uh, caspase uh, um, 1, pre, uh, the pre-caspase 1. It, gets, it lyses that, it gets activated into active caspase, which lyses uh, these pre-IL1 beta and the IL18. And then you have active um, IL1, which then goes out into the um, uh, extracellular area to have its activities. So two signals is the thing that it's important to see, and that there are lots of things like particulates and things, danger things in cells that can get these guys activated and release the IL-1 beta, which uh, if you think evolutionarily, it would be great to have something like that 
that could get triggered. Question. Yeah. I'm missing a key point here. Is everything on that slide sort of normal biology? I mean, where's the pathology? Yeah, that's normal. We're going to get to the pathology. Okay. Because, so uh, you really want inflammasomes. We all want this to work. Uh, but like in cats, diseases, this protein actually is mutated. And there's probably other abnormalities that they haven't been able to describe because they, you also get high reactive oxygen species in the cell uh, that don't react normally. Uh, but yeah, so you probably have guys like that working right now uh, after you got off the treadmill <laughs> that are cranking out this stuff. Are there any diseases, Joyce, where this is absent? Like, or is, is this a fatal genetic mistake if these aren't present, or are there people that don't have these? You know, I, I actually don't know. These are, because uh, on these, uh, the, some of them, when you go, I'll show you another slide, that there, there are some that are loss of function and there are ones that are gain of function. Um, and there probably are some that are fatal, but also biology has all of these backup systems and there's lots of other um, uh, of these inflammasomes that can do activities. So uh, my guess would be uh, that probably you have a spectrum of disease. Which makes me wonder, because when you look at caps, that's way over, that's like one in a million disease, literally, these diseases. We as allergists probably don't need to worry about these diseases. They're one in a million. But what about the ones that have little, I mean, look at all these things that could get go wrong in that cell uh, that could have an impact on how much I have uh, one data that you make. So there may be, you know, partial variants of this that we've just missed all these years. And this just shows you it uh, kind of in the, <laughs> so you can actually see it. Uh, but here's a toll-like receptor here. Uh, it activates the, um, uh, the, the transcription and translation in the, uh, in the nucleus. And uh, so you get the pro-IL-1 beta. And then here's a second signal here, something that gets uh, the NR, NLRP3 protein activated or here where you've got a mutation where you start getting this kind of constituent development of these uh, what we call inflammasomes. Uh, here's the caspase 1 that starts slicing the IL-1 beta. Um, and then because the uh, IL-1 beta can stimulate itself, this is self-stimulating, you can see that if you don't have something to put the brakes on, this just could go to town. And so uh, this was, I think, Lynn's question. So here's um, uh, IL-1 uh, receptor antagonist in healthy and in CAPS monocytes. So in healthy people and in um, CAPS monocytes, there's an early phase. And you can see here um, that a PAMP here that turns on the cell and it starts making some IL-1 uh, beta. Uh, the IL-1 beta can stimulate lymphocytes, which start producing cytokines. Uh, they stimulate macrophages here, which uh, do PATH, PGE, and cytokines, and they stimulate the endothelium that starts making a whole bunch of um, active inflammatory mediators as well. So one signal, and then you start getting that, and both cells do that, but then you get three to six hours later, you get this late phase, and in a healthy monocyte, what happens is you start making the um, IL-1 receptor antagonist, and so it'll bind to the lymphocyte and actually shut off the cytokine production there binds to the macrophage, you get blocking of those inflammatory mediators, binds to the endothelium, blocks those, and binds to itself, so it turns itself off. And that's what a healthy cell will do. But in a CAPS monocyte, uh, you don't get the, uh, anti, uh, the IL-1 receptor antagonist. You just start, continue to get uh, kind of constitutive IL-1 beta, and so it's very busy just in getting everything inflamed. Uh, by this one little tiny trigger of the PAMP. And so, um, and then this is a model again for dysregulation and if this is a healthy cell here and it triggers a single uh, toll-like receptor. Uh, you get a little bit of reactive oxygen species here, it turns on this antioxidant response, you start getting on the IL-1 receptor antagonist. But also there's ATP and other triggers uh, that then turn on the inflammasome or activate the inflammasome, start making the IL-1 <clears throat> beta. So in a healthy person, there's a nice balance between these two. You, this usually gets started first, and then you start making this in the late phase, and it stays nice and balanced. So since you're not using the pointer on the uh, computer, the people outside don't see the pointer? 
So just mention which panel you're on. Okay. Okay. And in uh, panel B there, you can see the uh, pathogen-associated uh, <clears throat> uh, molecular patterns. There's a whole bunch of them, so you're getting big activation of the cell. You get this big uh, reactive oxygen species burst, which dampens down uh, the oxidative stress. And so you have reduced IL-1 uh, receptor antagonist de development. At the same time, with this big response, you get a lot of ATP, and you get this inflammasome activated, and you get a ton of IL-1 beta. And so there's an unbalance of the cytokine network, but it's an appropriate um, unbalance because you've got all of this um, danger out there that's turning on the cell. But in the, in the third panel there, uh, in the CAPS monocyte, you can see you've got this little tiny tr trigger, just like uh, in panel A, uh, but you get this big uh, reactive oxygen uh, species, uh, damp down IL-1 receptor antagonist, and at the same time, this big IL-1 beta um, response. So it's acting as though there's horrible danger out there when there really isn't. And so when you look at CAP subtypes, there's really this spectrum of diseases. And at this end is the familiar cold um, uh, uh, autoinflammatory syndrome here. And those people, uh, they get an urticarial rash. Uh, they get mild arthralgias. In terms of the central nervous system, they have mild headaches. They get some conjunctivitis, uh, a little bit of fever and fatigue. Uh, their uh, flares are really cold-induced, um, and they actually rarely get amyloidosis. So it, if you think about it in terms of inflammation, it's uh, kind of on the mild end of it. Um, in muckle wells, um, let's see, uh, a little bit further on the scale, um, and those people actually do get headache, migraines. Um, they get progressive hearing loss. They lose their hearing in their uh, beginning in like their 20s. Uh, they get, get <clears throat> significant conjunctivitis, uh, fatigue and malaise. And uh, about 25% of people in a large European study uh, who had muckle wells developed um, amyloidosis. And then the neonatal onset disease is really the most severe. These guys get really destructive arthritis, exostosis. They get horrible contractures. Uh, they get uh, chronic meningitis seizures. Um, they also lose their hearing. Uh, their symptoms are continuous, um, and they actually get pathledema um, and growth retardation and significant amyloidosis if you don't catch it. So this is a spectrum of essentially severity. So what differs genetically amongst them? Well, if you look, they actually all affect the chy cryopyrin protein, um, and I don't think they've figured out why one is over here and why is one is over there. And as you'll see in, in a bit, there are also IL-1 beta production, uh, overproduction syndromes, where instead of getting hives, you get pustulosis. And the question would be, why would you see that in the, in, on the skin? And I don't think anybody knows. And the people who get it periodically, why aren't they sick all the time? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, <laughs> we're going to have to ask a higher power because I can't tell you. <laughs> so this uh, shows you familial cold inflammatory syndrome. And you can see why. I mean, they really do look like garden variety hives. And uh, everybody in this room has had patients that look like that in their, in their office. So you kind of go back and think about what are those patients that never got better? Uh, but they present early in life. They do, um, particularly with uh, these uh, like cold familial and the ones that aren't so severe, they think they're significantly underdiagnosed uh, because they become people, they're not, you know, they complain a little bit of feeling lousy and we just don't pick it up until they're in their 20s or 30s and they've got starting to get hearing loss and stuff like that. How common is this at 40? Uh, very uncommon. Like, um, I think this is like one in 300,000. Uh, uh, the neonatal onset is something like one in a so very few people in this room are going to see classic. Uh, I'm curious, does anybody in the room have a patient? Isn't that a historical diagnosis, or is there a particular like test you do? Oh, uh, well, we'll talk about yeah. that. We might, I mean, you might see it. <laughs> yes, I'm not doing the test. Yeah, I may mean, just occasionally, when I'm scratching my head, checks and see that I'm protein and amyloid. Um, and so this is uh, Muckle Wells, a 54-year-old with Muckle Wells, and again, uh, pretty much the same distribution as what we see with chronic hives. 
And this is a kid with neonatal um, onset multi-system autoinflammatory uh, disease. And, uh, this kid was in a study and he was at actually at the institution for a week. And this is what his skin looked like, the class bacterial rash, but the rash stayed there the whole week. It didn't come and go. Uh, these are the contractures that you get in the, in the knees. Um, this kid had bilateral haplodema in his eyes. And this is a skin biopsy, and what you mostly see is uh, uh, perivascular leukocytes. Occasionally it's in both, but not much. And the thing that's really interesting is you can see the uh, surface is totally untouched. Um, and this is an MRI of his knee. The, you don't get like synovial stuff, but you get this overgrowth of the bony area here, um, and exostosis. And so that's what neonatal onset multisystem inflammatory disease looks like. Uh, there are lots of other ones. Um, uh, Dura was the last of the described ones in 2009, which is deficiency of the IL-1 receptor antagonist. Again, ne neonatal onset of autoinflammatory disease. Uh, this is a homozygous mutation, um, and the mutated IL-1 receptor antagonist can't bind with the receptor. Uh, like I said, interestingly, this gets localized or generalized sterile pustules as opposed to hive-like lesions. These guys can get ichthyosis-type lesions, nail changes, joint swelling, osteomyelitis, skeletal in, uh, malformations, and hepatitis glenomeglia. Um, and they don't really get recurrent uh, fever episodes. Um, so again, like uh, Lynn asks, why does one get a three-day uh, three flares like that, and like this, other people just get the continuous, and nobody and this gives you an idea of what uh, Dura looks like in a little kid. And you can see here, um, on the, the left <coughs> end here, the pustulosis that the kids get. Uh, here's the epiphyseal um, uh, ballooning in the knees. Uh, they have uh, widening between the ribs and between the um, uh, clavicles. Um, here's hypertrophic ossification. And they get sclerotic uh, lesions in the bones as well. Um, and probably, I suspect nobody here has seen one of these. <laughs> and then there's pyogenic arthritis, pyoderma gangrenosa, and acne syndrome. Uh, it's a rare autosomal dominant disease. And this one has a mutation in proline, serine, creamine, phosphatase, and interactin protein. Uh, again, it results in the same sort of thing, uh, enhancing the chromosome activation uh, via pyrin uh, that results in capsase one driven uh, IL 1 beta. These guys start developing sterile pyogenic arthritis that starts in early childhood. Um, but, um, and they get severe nod uh, nodular cystic acne and painful pyoderma. And by adult, uh, by the time they become adults, their arthritis actually can diminish, but the skin lesions get progressively worse. <coughs> and this gives you an idea. Here's an adult in this, just these pustular lesions. And, uh, are really nasty diseases. And this is Schnitzler syndrome, which is really interesting. Uh, this is sort of like an adult onset uh, systemic inflammatory disease. Um, they, the onset happens after the age of 50. Um, again, they get this almost classic urticarial lesion. Um, and they get some myalgias, arthralgias, and they get kind of um, uh, periodic um, flares. Uh, and uh, there was, uh, I read a review that said there were 250 cases that have been described. Uh, they feel this one is probably the most underdiagnosed of these diseases. And again, I've been going through the Rolodex in my mind of people with late onset, but I've missed some of these. Joyce, people don't have Rolodexes anymore. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but we talked about how we were. Do you remember when we did journal stuff? I know. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm looking around like, all these gray hair, we all have gray hair now. <laughs> we still have Rolodexes. So. Yeah. so what is a diagnostic approach? And, and you know, these are one in a million diseases. Should we be up at night worrying about them? When we see those urticarial eruptions, obviously you want to think about uh, our bread and butter, which is really just an immediate urticarial. Uh, but if, uh, with the arthralgias and the fatigue, you want to think about CAPS or Schnitzler syndrome. But you also want to think, maybe, could there be some variants of that? And then urticarial vasculitis, and that you can differentiate on a biopsy because you get more of that fibrinoid uh, necrosis around the blood vessels. Um, and then SADS with pustular lesions, you want to think about pustular psoriasis, 
acute generalized xanthomous pustulosis, and then isolated areas of pyreonitis present um, uh, kind of in that diagnostic. So um, the algorithm, um, I think, which you, you asked was kind of, you start with the history, uh, also look at the family history and the age of onset. And the lab tests that are helpful are CEDRIC and C-reactive protein, because when people have flares, uh, with these diseases, they always go up. Uh, the other thing uh, is serum amyloid uh, A, or, uh, which is intermittently elevated. Uh, the SAA levels are actually associated with an increased risk of amyloidosis. Um, and the S100 proteins, the A89 and the A12, have actually been reported to be useful uh, markers for detecting subclinical inflammation in these diseases. The biopsy, as we talked about, the histopathology, uh, both in the ones that have kind of the highs and the ones that have the pustular diseases, just show this, these neutrophil-rich cell infiltrates uh, with rare eosinophils. And genetic testing to confirm the diagnosis of monogenetic um, uh, systemic inflammatory, auto-inflammatory diseases um, is reasonable, but the caveat is 40% uh, with clear phenotype of monogenetic AID or actual mutation negative. Uh, so it's not, it's not going to get you there. There really currently are no good biomarkers where you can put your finger on it and say that's what we, the disease that this person has. Uh, so what is the treatment? The treatment is actually the really exciting part of this. Um, since the early 70s, colchicine has been used successfully in the treatment of familial Mediterranean fever. And nobody really knows how it works, uh, but it does work. It's been successful. But uh, the, really the advent of the modern world was in 2003, um, an anti-L1 beta blocker uh, was used in a, there was a New England Journal uh, report, uh, a case of two patients who had muckle well syndrome. They had daily symptoms, they had elevated serum amyloid, and they had dramatic resolution of their symptoms within hours of, of getting their first um, anti-L1 beta. And then they had normalization of the serum amyloid in the course of and interestingly, even the people that have the um, hearing problems, uh, some of that actually gets better when you treat. And so for these folks, early diagnosis is really critical. Uh, sometimes these people have this disease for years before someone finally makes the diagnosis. But now there are really good treatments for it. And this is just to kind of sh to talk about um, anti-IL-1. The one that's been used the most is the one on the left there, which is anakinra. And uh, that's a, actually an IL-1 receptor antagonist. Um, it's a prominent protein. Uh, key thing is its uh, half-life is five hours, so it has to be taken daily, given daily, um, subcutaneous. Uh, it has been approved for rheumatoid arthritis and CAPS. Uh, as I said, it was used in rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, it's pretty amazing, because if you look at the joints, it works beautifully for the joints. Uh, you can decrease the inflammation get some um, um, modulation of the uh, pathogenesis, but the overall chronic inflammation in people with rheumatoid arthritis is not that helpful. Um, and only about 50% of people got some significant improvements. It's not typically used for that. But off-label uses, they're using it for a lot of things. Um, uh, uh, systemic juvenile inflammatory arthritis, um, uh, adult onset Stills disease, um, uh, gout, um, Schnitzler syndrome, so they're trying it on a lot of different things. Uh, Rolanicef uh, uh, is a, a activator two of a, a antagonist. Uh, the nice thing about it, it has an 8J half-life. Uh, in the United States, it's only approved actually for caps. Um, hasn't been as much done with that. Um, Canakinumab um, is actually an anti-IL-1 antibody. And again, it's got this super long half-life, uh, 26 days. So the injections on that are um, one to two months. And all of these diseases, uh, there are doses, but everybody has different disease, so the doses uh, really have to be personalized. Um, subcutaneous, and it's been approved for, um, believe it or not, gout, uh, the systemic juvenile inflammatory arthritis, and for caps. Um, we're using it on adults stills and Schnitzler syndrome, but the exciting stuff is in testing, they're looking at it in coronary artery disease and in type 2 diabetes. Um, remember we said that the IL-1 can uh, cause a beta cell death. Uh, 
Um, and uh, also, and we've talked, and, and uh, it's not listed there, but they're also testing it in osteoarthritis. Uh, so treating that inflammation there. And this is the newest one, it hasn't been approved yet, um, Gevokizumab, uh, which is also an anti-IL-1 uh, beta. Uh, again, with a nice long half-life. Uh, and it hasn't been approved, but in testing, there's uh, coronary artery disease, diabetes, uh, Bichette syndrome, and some of the case reports on Bichette syndrome makes a huge difference in the oral lesions, um, and then pyoderma gangliosin. So I think in the next probably five years, there's going to be an explosion of uh, how these are used in what we now are realizing are autoinflammatory diseases that are kind of the bread and butter stuff. So we talked about the one in a million um, muscle wells, but really there's probably lots of utility here in learning how to modulate that IL-1 uh, response. What sort of side effects have these had? Uh, it's amazingly, uh, compared to something like TNF-alpha blockers, it's been amazingly well tolerated. Um, it's given subcutaneously and people get kind of local reactions and stuff like that. Uh, but it hasn't been a, a, it's not like some of the other so Joyce, if you knock out IL-1 or IL-1 beta versus increasing the beta receptor antagonist, does that do the same thing? I mean, if you can decrease production of IL-1, does that do the same thing as making more of these antagonists, the receptor antagonists? With those, uh, with the antikinra, which is a receptor antagonist, and then the IL-1 beta uh, blocker, uh, you, at least clinically in patients, you get kind of the same response. Um, and I don't know in terms of mouse models whether they have good mouse models for one as opposed to the other. Um, again, I apologize, it's probably too small to see, but this is to remind you that first table we looked at was done in 2009. And here, uh, this, is, this would, is a shortened version of that table that we looked at in 2009 with some of these um, hereditary autoinflammatory diseases like CAPS and DURA um, and, and PAPA. But now the, here are all these other inflammatory diseases that we're talking about, um, Bichette's and gout, um, uh, and then things like osteoarthritis, <clears throat> pseudogout, rheumatoid arthritis, schnitzler's, and stills. So this whole other group of diseases, and I suspect that this list is going to continue to grow. Um, and this just shows you, um, in terms of animal models, this was a kind of a cool one. Uh, so with... Um, uh, this was kind of kinemab. So they took mice, uh, you know, this proof of concept kind of thing. They um, put like air pouches in their backs. Um, they injected them intraperitoneally with uh, nothing, saline, or a, a fake antibody, or with kinemab. And then subsequently um, uh, put in the air pouches these um, uh, IL 1 secreting cells. Um, and then they looked at the accumulation of PM inflammatory cells. And you can see uh, control nothing, uh, but uh, the saline and the, the full antibody, this huge inflammatory PMN influx here. And then with the kenakinabab, you get this dose-dependent decrease um, in the PMN influx, uh, and this is in an animal model. So uh, it just shows you how effective uh, these drugs are. And this gives you an idea of this is a, one of the uh, trials. They, here with Kanakinabad, they did an open label trial. Uh, then they do a withdrawal period and did a double blind. And then uh, they did another open label period to look at um, how effective it is in humans. And this gives you an idea. Here's the Kanakinabad, and this is a number of flares. And these are the people that had the placebo. Um, and and uh, so these just, these drugs are just like pretty amazing, and as I said, they uh, they will really prevent almost all of the disease um, uh, in the joints and the skin, um, uh, the hearing loss, and uh, the mental retardation. So these guys are really pretty amazing. And um, again, I, I hopefully you can read that on your handout. But here's those monogenetic. Um, auto-inflammatory diseases, and you can see the proposed mechanisms um, uh, inflammasome chronic activation, protein misfolding, uh, absence of the negative IL-1. So there's probably, there are a lot of proposed uh, uh, 
mechanisms for how it works in the different diseases. Uh, but then there are these like complex multi, uh, multifactorial acquired ones, uh, like we've talked about uh, juvenile onset inflammatory arthritis, Stills disease, Bichette's, um, and then there's the common stuff, which I think is what we're going to see more and more of, gout, diabetes. Uh, interestingly, in Alzheimer's, um, we have inflammasome activation by GAMPs and the amyloid and the reactive oxygen species. Um, and so they're actually uh, trying this out in uh, Alzheimer's as well. And then, you know, some, and in the future, when people are having heart attacks, they might give them aspirin and, and a little dash of anti-IL-1 in uh, <laughs> addition. And then they're starting to uh, describe these overlap syndromes that have uh, abnormalities both in the innate and the um, acquired uh, uh, immune arms. And I suspect whoever gives this talk in five years, this table is going to be gigantic. So as you want to, the most common one of these that many of us have seen actually is familial Mediterranean fever. Yeah. You want to say anything about it? Why is it most common? Why, how does it differ from the exotic one? Um, yeah, I can't actually speak to that. I didn't. I mostly concentrate on the cats. So. Yeah, I don't know if anybody else can. You commented that the uh, can of kinra is good for adult stills. Has anybody used it in children when they have regular stills to see if they can? mitigate that disease with this, or has it not been studied in kids? I don't know this been studied in kids. But um, I just, I'm sure there have been a few off-label <laughs> trials. <laughs> and you know, all of these, because all of these diseases are so rare to get enough people, uh, so a lot of the, the, the use is off-label and it's case reports. Um, so, uh, um, there's a review in there, um, what you guys know, uh, the Scott Kenner review. Um, uh, he talks about these new ones, and so it turns out that they're now there are monogenetic interferon off of these. Um, and you can see uh, there's already a long list of diseases that we've described. Um, a lot of them are loss of function, and some of them are gain of function, uh, but they have different kind of cardinal features. They have deep CNS calcification uh, for the skin instead of eyes or the pustules, they get nodules and paniculitis. Uh, they don't get joint stuff so much. They get myositis or muscle inflammation. Um, uh, and so there's a whole bunch of these diseases that have now been described. Um, and I think that's uh, probably going to end up being just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, so if you compare IL-1 versus the, uh, uh, the interferon-mediated autoinflammatory diseases, what you see is in IL-1 diseases, this uh, C-reactive protein actually tracks pretty closely with disease activity. Uh, you get uh, granulosis with flares. Uh, when you look in the brain on the people with meningitis, it's an asymptomatic neutrophil infiltration. Uh, you image their brain, they get arachnoid uh, adhesions, and as we talked about, uh, they get cochlear damage, so they lose their hearing. Uh, the skin lesions are the urticaria or the pustulosis. Uh, you get osteomyelitis, bony overgrowth. Typically, you don't get primary cardiovascular disease. Uh, the eye lesions are conjunctivitis, anterior uveitis, and that papilledema that we saw. Um, and an autoantibodies are very infrequent. And if you contrast that to the interferon mediated diseases that just started to be described, uh, the CRP is only elevated with severe flares. They get a leukopenia or a, a lymphopenia instead of the, um, the granulocytosis. Uh, if you look in their brain, they have mild lymphocytic infiltration, and they get basal ganglia calcification and white matter disease. Uh, the musculoskeletal stuff is myositis. Uh, the skin, they get paniculitis with immature neutrophils, and they'll get lipodystrophy. Uh, in their lungs, they get pulmonary fibrosis and interstitial lung disease. And uh, autoantibodies in these uh, interferon mediated diseases are actually very common. Um, and uh, the presence of autoimmune mediated organ disease shows you that it um, is even more complicated than that. This is a uh, very recently released um, um, uh, four novel autoinflammatory diseases. Um, this one here is called CARDS, uh, which stands for CARD-14 mediated psoriasis. And you get an excess of this CARDS um, activity. Uh, it promotes uh, the production 
production of a bunch of anti-inflammatory mediators, and it happens in keratinocytes. So what you get primarily is this skin disease here. Uh, there's uh, this one, which is, uh, let me see what we call this. Um, Just mixing what quadrant is what? This one, uh, the, the upper uh, right-hand quadrant, this is called PLADS uh, disease, which is PLCY2 associated antibody deficiency and immune dis dysregulation is what PLADS stands for. And you can see um, in the B cell, it dysregulates the B cells and um, they become unactive. And then it increases the secretion of uh, mediators from mast cells. So you get cold urticaria, low IgEG, atopy, cytopulmonary disease, and autoantibodies, recently uh, described. Um, this one uh, is a macrophage disease. Um, and also it turns out that there's uh, endothelial damage, so these people make more uh, tumor necrosis factor in IL-6, and they get vasculitis, <coughs> you can see the lipid uh, uh, right there on the, on the arm, but they get fever, strokes, vasculitis, and hepatosplenomaglia, and it's all kind of through this macrophage type cell. And then over here on the left lower panel, um, uh, let's see, what do they call this one? Um, they call it S... SIFD disease, which is um, sideroblastic anemia, immunodeficiency, fever, and developmental delay. And cells all around the body have deficiencies in this ability to um, uh, make protein. And they get sideroblastic anemia, fever, uh, B lymphopenia, low IgG, and then they get CNS uh, disease as well. And so these are four novel ones that are just beginning to be described. And there's probably, um, as I said, whoever so lucky enough to get this topic in five years, uh, we'll be describing well, tons of different diseases. Are these all kids' diseases again? Uh, and those, yes. Um, and, and as I said, so, you know, they only get described when you find really the, the one that's on the far end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So the thought is that a lot of these may be underdiagnosed, but you've got partial ones that we just don't recognize. So they're not that safe. David, do these kids wind up in children? Do you see them in in immunodeficiency clinics? I think we do. Uh, rheumatology also seeing them. The ADA2 deficiency, for example, we have two patients. Troy was on the New England paper, and I think um, they were considering transplant for them, so they're on the transplant list. We do see those uh, patients. I think one more thing to consider, and that was something that was described recently, all these negative, mutation-negative patients, um, I think it's, uh, what's his name, Hoffman in San Diego. Yeah. He studied a lot of these patients, and he showed actually that you can get somatic mutations, so it's enough to have mutation in uh, in a range of even 5% of the cells, and you can get the full, full blown phenotype. So you get mutation in subset of the patient. It's not a germline mutation. It develops later in life. They will have the full spectrum, but with regular uh, Sanger sequencing, you won't see it. Uh, so if you have a patient that you suspect might have one of these diseases, you need to refer them to a different place that will do very deep sequencing to find this uh, subset of, uh, of cells. Is there a, a woman rheumatologist at Children's who's pretty expert in this? Uh, I don't know her name. Uh, Matt? Jennifer uh, Turner. And Matt just made a diagnosis of a card mutation in urticarial patient that was seen at the U, and, and it was Rick Kepp, the last week's speaker, the uh, new German dermatologist there at Children's. It's yeah, that's a nice story. Al Hoffman is it. He's very, uh, I, I had a kid the other day I thought might have the familial cold autoimmune syndrome, and I just wrote to Al Hoffman, um, and he responds, he's easy to get a hold of, he's one of the leading experts. But he wrote back to me and said we had a local expert on the children's faculty here. And Stevens, is there a woman by that name? Uh, I think she's following mostly a very early onset SLE. I don't know if she's doing the auto-inflammatory. But another another person to contact is Josh Miller from the NIH, and that's the card 11. We were just at the CIS meeting, and that was just a chance we heard about the mutation. He has another two patients with similar mutation. It's a new, we don't fully understand it yet, but it might be a nice collaboration. And he's going to be here on June 16, giving a talk at uh, Children's, so if somebody wants to come and hear him. I think that's a nice opportunity. He's mostly dealing with immune deficiencies associated with allergy or atopy. So the PLC gamma 2 was described by his, by his group. The CARD 11 will be something that should come up. He also described the, stat, the hyper IG STAT 3 uh, autosomal dominant uh, mutation. So it should be interesting. And one thing uh, that I see commonly, because I see a lot of hives, 
I see hives that are more persistent than they should be. People who, you know, the hives don't clear in hours. But if you ask them, do these lesions stay in the same place? And they say, yeah, it's been like that for four days. Um, and I always wonder what they have. They don't seem to have the rest of this. They don't have a, a generalized systemic disease. I just call it chronic pruritic dermatitis. It's not really dermatitis because they don't, they don't lichenify. So I, I don't know what to make of those people. Yes, like yesterday we had this patient with really persistent, aggressive verticaria, and he, they were transient, but then he'd get uh, bruising like a couple days later. So we're, you know, kind of getting hooked up with dermatology. Okay, have have biopsy. Biopsy. There's, There's a spectrum of people, I don't know what they have. They just have persistent hives. They all respond, they respond well to cyclosporin, just like conventional chronic idiopathic urticaria, but they have something a little bit different. So if you do a lab on all of these, uh, does CRP go up in a lot of these mm -hmm. patients? Yes. Yeah, so so how do you know... Where should we be going with that? So, so if I had a patient like this now, um, and they were the ones that you described, when it just seemed a little different than our garden variety stuff, uh, when they're when they're having a flare, the CRP always goes up, and they also say that the the amyloid is a good marker if you get it during the flare. So those might be two things that I would think about doing just as a screen until we get better diagnostics. Recently, I've been doing some labs and. Quite a few of my patients have elevated CRP, so does, would that go up with just the normal anticarial response without this? You know, um, I used to, you know, back in the day when we were supposed to check all of these things for uh, mutual up the systemic stuff with um, I didn't hardly ever got into it for now, holidays to that protein. And now I don't check anymore because of choosing wisely, so, um, so I don't know. The thing that's kind of exciting, um, well, first, this, there, we, clearly there are going to be more of these novel auto-inflammatory diseases. This is just the tip of the iceberg. But also, this, the thing that's most intriguing to me is these chronic anti-inflammatory diseases. Uh, as I get older, my joints get creepier. I'm thinking about, you know, could I have a, a little shot of IL-1, um, uh, anti-IL-1 occasionally. But the cool thing is they're developing a lot of these smaller molecules that inhibit cytokine signaling. Uh, and the attraction of those is they could be oral administration, and you could pro pro probably adjust the doses for optimal tuning. So instead of turning off the IL-1, you could kind of, in the cell, uh, ad uh, adjust the doses. And um, so these are three, you, you can see, that are actually, um, that they're developing right now. There's an oral active a cast phase one inhibitor, uh, uh, another inhibitor here, and this is a blocker of NLRP. You can imagine you could develop lots of much more specific signals. You can take them orally, you can adjust the dose a lot better. And I think that the two, you know, really future things are more of these diseases and some really cool drugs in the future. And this kind of shows you, and it's, it just shows you how fast medicine is. In the first 15 years that we did the Journal Club, <laughs> hardly anything had changed. But here, these diseases were really basically described in the year 2000. Uh, they tried, you know, NSAIDs and then cyclosporin and stuff like that. Then we got the biologics, uh, which 2003, the first anti-IL-1 uh, receptor antagonist was used in muckle wells. And now we're talking about these oral things that um, could really help us modulate the immune system. Uh, so I think you know the future is going to be very exciting. Um, and, uh, and that's all I know about this disease. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>
Is it L? Yeah. L, my whole last name, L, A, 